Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Universalists of New Braunfels Sunday Hybrid Service. I'm Diane Rahm, and today I'll be your service leader. If you're pre present in the gathering room, welcome. We also welcome our Zoom participants that join us from home. We are a welcoming congregation. Come as you are and know you are appreciated here. We have a shared ministry. The first Sunday of the month, our minister, Reverend Adekra Ba, is in the pulpit. Other Sundays, we draw on inspiration from members of this congregation, members of the community, or visiting ministers. Today, we are delighted to hear from Dr. Rebecca Bell Medaru, who's going to share some thoughts on education. If you are new and wish to receive a copy of our newsletter or want more information, please email us. Our email address is uunb135 at gmail.com. And if you're in the gathering room, please stay after the service for coffee and conversation so we might get to know you better. If you're on Zoom, please join after the service the discussion that will occur there. We light our chalice this morning with the words of Reverend Elizabeth Harding of the Second Unitarian Church of Chicago. We Unitarian Universalists don't drink from our chalice. Instead, we use it to hold the flame. The circle of the chalice helps keep the fire small. The flame doesn't bind us. It doesn't burn us. It gives us light so we can see all the different things in the universe, even the invisible ones, because the Unitarian Universalist flame is a flame of the light of learning. Dr. Rebecca Bell Medaro represents the fifth district on the State Board of Education. She teaches film in the English department at Texas State University, where she also directs an interdisciplinary media studies program that she has developed. She was a Fulbright Scholar and professor at the University of St. Louis, Senegal, and taught as a visiting professor at the University of Nebraska. She grew up on a farm in northern Indiana, graduated from a one-building K-12 public school along with 17 classmates. And from there, she went to Indiana University where she met her future husband, John Pierre Medero. After receiving their masters, they joined the Peace Corps in Chad, and, which is one of the 10 poorest countries in the world. They taught grade school and high school in Bonger, and at the University of Chad and in the United States Information Service in the capital. They served as French language interpreters for the United States Air Force grain flights to drought-stricken Sahel. After receiving doctorates from Indiana University, Rebecca joined Southwest Texas State University, as it used to be called, and her husband joined Texas Lutheran College. As a researcher and author, Rebecca has delivered over 100 professional papers, authored four books, and 16 book chapters, and 29 scholarly articles, and 12 separate reference entries. She served as special assistant to President Supple at Te Texas State University for two years, and was the campus director of a Ford Foundation grant on diversity, service learning, and media literacy across the curriculum. As a teacher and mother of two daughters, Rebecca volunteered uh, in the SCMISD enrichment program and produced videos for <clears throat> Texas case management, children and pregnant women, and worth and weight programs. She served on the San Marcos Bond Committee that fu found, funded a library and bike lanes and on a task force to develop citywide recycling. She was also a city planning and zoning commissioner. Rebecca supports interdisciplinary education, including critical thinking, civics, research, and vocational skills that prepare students for work, advanced study, lifelong learning, and creative growth 
as they face such economic and social challenges as COVID-19 and a rapidly changing climate. And now we are pleased to welcome Rebecca and hear her message on the state of education in the States. Much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I'm really uh, excited to be here because I think that uh, the message of uh, Unitarians has, has the concept of unity in it. And that's one of the things that we need to solve the problems that are affecting the entire planet. Uh, I was once interviewed about uh, my teaching and I just blurted out, I teach to save the world. And uh, my husband made a lot of fun of that uh, saying, but, but it's really true. Uh, I, I think we have a planet that is in such urgent danger that we all must unite to do everything we can to rescue our fragile environment. Now, the state of education in Texas and across the United States um, has some bright spots, but it also has some problems. When I finally joined the State Board of Education after uh, not winning the seat for three times in a row, on the fourth time I actually won the district, and um, then uh, the process of redistricting took over, and I was in danger of being districted out of District 5. But what happened then was that there was actually, there were other people uh, who were Democrats and Republicans who were being gerrymandered out of their districts because they had the audacity to vote against some charter school proposals that were presented to the board. So suddenly the, the ground has kind of shifted in Texas but it's shifting all over the United States. We have had public education since our founding. It's one of the founding principles of a democracy to have public education, free compulsory public education. But now the interests of commerce and profit are creeping into our educational system. And in Texas, we have Bill 1882, which facilitates the help from charter schools for what they like to call failing schools. Texas has the largest permanent school fund in the United States, and the money that they use for the school uh, does not come from the oil and gas industry anymore. It comes from a fund that uh, takes all kinds of investments. But we rank 28th in per pupil spending in Texas, even though we have this enormous fund to fund public, public education. The policies in Texas are actually doing everything they can to undermine public education and to raise the status and uh, the presence of charter schools. So I have a message of hope because I would have been districted out of my district if I had not had the help of people on the opposite side of the political aisle because they were being targeted as well. And I'm sorry to say that a couple of people that I've become friends with uh, on the other side of the aisle, uh, did not win their primaries. So uh, it will be an interesting future for education in Texas on the board once that, um, that new batch of people come in. I intend to find whatever area of unity I can with those people because we must find common ground in order to improve education. Now, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the history of the State Board of Education in Texas because it's an interesting one. Back when uh, women did not have the vote in the United States, women got the vote in Texas. 
That's, did, it, did you all know that? That women had the vote in Texas for state offices before that? Well, uh, Governor uh, William Hobby at the time was worried about not winning his election. So he cut a deal with Annie Webb Blanton. Does anybody recognize the name Blanton? Blanton Museum, it's that family. And he said, you know, you can be the first uh, secretary of education, state secretary of education, if you can rustle up the votes from women. And that's what she did. And so she actually became the first woman in office in Texas, and she ran the State Board of Education. So it's a board that has had a lot of importance for a long time. And the three things that they do seem pretty simple, but, but they're important. They oversee the permanent school fund, and that's about $47 billion. Uh, they also oversee the certification of teachers and all of the regulations in Texas and the curriculum. So they determine what our children will learn. Now I say we determine that. It's not like we're sitting down there writing everything that children are going to learn, but we appoint people to uh, be subject matter experts and to create that curriculum. It has been a learning experience for me to be on the board and see how people can fight over a little tiny word. For example, when we were working on the climate curriculum, we battled over the word can because the State Board of Education is advised by the Energy Council. And what kind of energy do you think is on that Energy Council? Yeah, it just doesn't have a lot of renewable energy. They don't even like the word renewable because they say, well, fossil fuels are renewable. You can keep going in and getting more of them. You could dig at the bottom of the ocean and get more. Uh, so every single word counts. And one of our members is an intellectual property lawyer for Shell Oil. So he is a, a very bright and determined uh, opponent of anything that will help renewables, although he knows perfectly well that that is the future. And so we have some interesting conversations and I was trying to get people to get rid of the word that uh, the climate can be warmed by uh, human activity, can be warmed. And I was saying, no, it is warming as a result of human activity. And we voted on that, and the majority uh, voted to keep the word can. To sow some doubt, maybe it is just natural cycles. We even had a guy who, who came in and said, oh, it's the position of the sun. That's what's, do, that's what's doing the warming. And um, so we have to make sure that we, that we continue to uh, pay attention to the science because the state of education in the United States is affected by Texas. It's not that we buy the textbooks anymore or that everybody else has to use because with modern publishing, they can make a Texas version of textbooks. And they do. Uh, but we, are, we constitute about one in 10 school children. And so what happens in Texas doesn't stay in Texas. I wanna check my time here. I've got about five minutes left, so I want to, uh, they had to bring a message of hope. We have the opportunity now to, to convince people of the importance of uniting. And that is what I do constantly. It's not that I don't speak up for science, for all of the, all of the, uh, the things that we want our children to learn, but we have to find that common ground. And one of those places of common ground is on civics education. Civics, teaching people that they can vote, teaching people how government is structured. 
And our students uh, are in a, in, a, in a world where they want to escape reality. They're aware of what is happening to our planet. And I won't quote uh, Diane here but uh, exactly, but she was saying that she had a student who had said, well, we are uh, another word for screwed. And, uh, and I, I have had some of my students express the same idea. But we have to use media to point to the people who do bring hope. Greta Thunberg sailing across the Atlantic Ocean on a sailboat to make her point about climate change. We think of the people who, who are, are working as hard as they can in Ukraine to survive. And that little tiny country looks like, we'll keep our fingers crossed, it looks like they will win the battle against one of the top three uh, nations and militaries in the world. So we must educate our children in their civic responsibilities and rights. And we must also give them a lesson of hope so that they believe that it's possible. And that means telling the stories of heroes and then going back and checking whether the media has presented those stories accurately. And if they're not accurate, why did they make those changes? I teach film and I can tell you, there's no film that gets everything factually correct. But that's fine. It's a creative medium. But we have to teach our children how to handle media. Media is the great distraction. Simone Weil, the uh, philosopher, she was a French philosopher uh, during World War II, and she was Jewish, but she converted to Catholicism. And she was so devoted that she decided that she was not going to eat anything more than the soldiers on the battlefield had to eat. Well, she was a little tiny woman, and she ended up basically starving herself to death. But she wrote a lot during that time. And one of the things that she focused on was the concept of attention. And this is uh, the subject of a, of a book by uh, Casey Schwartz, who's a you know, young American woman, who got fascinated with this philosopher. Because she was an addict of Adderall uh, for attention deficit disorder. And this is a problem that a lot of our young people have in education. They can't pay attention. They can't just sit still and pay attention. They want to be distracted from what is happening here and now. And we must teach our children how to pay attention and what to pay attention to. Education is an opportunity to bring these students joy. Even if they're studying something depressing like World War II, or like the slaughter of all the buffalo, uh, or practically all the buffalo on the North American continent, or uh, the extermination of Indian tribes, or the Holocaust. The reason there's a source of joy there is that we manage to see our mistake and pull back and stop and try to correct that mistake. But it takes getting people's attention. And that means that every time somebody's talking about some fantasy or some terrible disaster, our responsibility as educators is to look at the facts. Say, we need to find out what is the reality. We, we need to make that search. And then we need to look for those people who are heroes, who are not willing to simply uh, accept this, this march toward destruction. Education is the tool, and the young people will teach their parents. If we start teaching them about the importance of the, the, the R's, do you know what the R's are? Reduce, reuse, recycle, yeah. And reducing 
is one of the most important things that we do. We don't have to consume so much in every facet. We can reuse things. And the last thing, recycling, yeah, that's, that's a good thing to do. But we must educate our children in those practices. And then maybe they won't ask their parents for the biggest, shiniest new thing at, at Christmas time. Maybe they'll say, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to give some money to uh, Greenpeace, or I'd like to give some money to uh, save the children. I'd like to, I'd like to use whatever you were going to spend for me uh, on something that's actually going to rescue the planet. And education has the most information that it has ever had in the history of the planet. We've got the education out there, but we have to teach skills, skills of research, so that our students know what peer-reviewed means. And they know the difference between fake news and news that has been verified and checked, fact-checked. We have to make sure that education doesn't end up falling prey to uh, this mania for assessment. In Texas, we have developed every kind of iteration of tests to see what have our students learned. And now, we have a fine science. We lay out what they're supposed to learn. We drill it into their heads day after day, week after week, month after month, and they're all just going crazy with the stress, the boredom, the fear, and they're not learning as much as they used to. When teachers would just talk about the subject, tell them the story of something that happened in history, go into the science lab and figure out how to, to, to uh, do an, an experiment. We must be sure that we have the tools for our children to benefit from history. And we have to take the responsibility in Texas for having one-tenth of those children in the United States and make sure that we don't test them to death, that we move toward an education that follows what teachers want to do, which is explore creativity, explore how to find the truth. Thank you very much. We extinguish our chalice. We extinguish the flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.